Stop recording. And all right, hey guys. Um, my name is Andrew. This is Zach. We're here today speaking about how to find a company Breakpoint. We're from Breakpoint Labs. On their own name, but what this talk is all about is uh, essentially modern day hacking, which, as we all know, is a lot like this, right? Using the force to get in. Um, the reality is, um, the inspiration for this talk was really about when we talk to people that are new to pen testing and information security. There's a mindset of, well, you scan it with Nessus and you exploit Metasploit, right? That's how you get in. And uh, we like to kind of show you know, how we commonly get in five common ways and it doesn't involve those techniques necessarily. This is a quick agenda. We're going to run through, like I said, five common ways we, we get into a network initially, get our initial foothold. Um, so my name is Andrew, this is Zach. We're the Red Team at Breakpoint Labs. We do a lot of commercial and DoD pen testing red team work. We also do blogging and podcasting at Primal Security as our kind of nighttime stuff. Um, we've given this talk and some variations of this talk at past B sides uh, here in the RBA sec. Um, and we're also a past certification junkie. We haven't done it in a while just because we are kind of more in the hands on. I'm kind of really waiting for off sex web course coming up, coming online. There's whispers in the wind of a coming. Wait, so, that. Long time coming. Yeah, and then we like Python, CTFs, long walks on the beach. So if you guys are <laughs> local to uh, the Annapolis area, uh, Zach actually runs Knapsack, Annapolis Sack. Um, it's like a local monthly meetup group. Yeah, myself and a guy from Lars run so feel free to check it out. It's just a nice happy hour. You can meet once a month, meet new people, network, things of that nature. So. So to get started, things have changed since the 90s, right? In the 90s, we got in with weak passwords and spear phishing. And then today, we get in with weak passwords and spear phishing. So I guess things haven't changed too much. Maybe there's USB instead of floppies, right? But um, we're going to kind of go, we'll go through. That's just a little joke there. But there's no review of this talk. Uh, like I said, it's the goal is to break the minds of scan and exploit to give you some practical examples of kind of walking you through how we break into a network. And we're going to cover five five techniques, and a couple of these are not going to surprise you here, but we're going to walk through how we do it. Hopefully you guys pick up some tips. If not, then you know, we can just share our TTPs here. Um, and before we get started, uh, just a high-level overview of a pen test methodology. This is the one we like to, to give with our customers because of the two main points. A lot of things we see with our customers is they come for a pen test, they say, scan us, run your tools on us, right? So we like to break out our methodology, automated testing and manual testing, so we actually show them, hey, there's a lot more than just running the tool, and we, we bake in that manual testing piece so it can help justify you know, the hours you're, you're bidding on that project. You can let them know that there's a lot more than just clicking the nest scan button. And then it's also important to do the planning and scoping. We actually had an engagement recently where you know, we had a customer come to us and say, pen test us so we can find out how the hackers got in. I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, well, we're already hacked. I'm like, well, <laughs> we need to do something a little different. Let's, let's, let's do some incident response work. But, so it's important to understand like, why your customer wants to do that assessment, because you might actually need to offer them a different service. But. <laughs> So this is a one pager on how to go beyond a scan. Like I said, when we, we did other variations of this talk, we actually have a talk, um, like a 50 minute talk, just on this slide, broken out the deeper level. But the whole mindset here, and again, this is for people that are kind of new to pen testing, is you're going to fail a whole lot more than you succeed. So if you're going to get used to failure, luckily with me, I failed a lot in life, so I'm kind of already used to it. Uh, <laughs> don't too hard yourself. Uh, fail a lot, but I just don't give up. I'm persistent, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not an advanced persistent, but I'm like a basic persistent. But, um, <laughs> you got to fail a thousand times and keep trying. That's important. You know, you learn that if you go through offset, offset OSCP, you're like, you get all the MSO 8067 boxes, and you're like, all right, now what? Right. And you kind of scratch your head a little bit. But you know, you learn that you learn to grow beyond that, and you start to gather more information. So get ready to fail if you're getting into this field. Um, then I like to say that a lot of our success is from recon and mapping. Um, basically, finding the systems and finding the content that others have missed. Um, and again, that goes into like with web applications, unlinked content enumeration is huge. We're going to talk about that in an example. Um, automated testing. This talk is oftentimes we give this talk of like you're bashing Nessus. And we are. We, we, love, we like these tools, just knowing the right tool for the right job, right? So you're not going to run Nessus against a web application per se. If you are, you're not going to get good data. It's not, it's not a great tool for that. Um, there are other tools for that kind of thing. So just knowing what tool to use for the job is important. Uh, and then the manual testing piece. So customers always ask me, like, what do you mean by manual testing? I say, well, what I'm trying to do is identify all the areas of user input, and I'm going to fuzz them. And I'm going to try to also misuse the technology features, and, and essentially abuse technology features. So what that means is if the technology allows me to upload a file for an avatar, well, I'm going to try to shovel code in it, right? So I'm going to try to misuse the feature. Uh, and then I'm going to try to combine all the findings, root false pods, all that good stuff. So it's all the stuff that you know necessarily shouldn't be in the report per se. Uh, and then the, the other important thing here is highlight business impact. 
So your, your scan tools don't do a good job at this because they don't understand the customer's business. So we've had customers that, you know, uh, availability is the king to them. They say, if this system goes offline, I'm losing a lot of money per hour. So if I find a denial of service vulnerability, that's going to be rated a little higher. You know, and vice versa if you have confidentiality issues. So you can kind of re relate it back to their business terms, and it can help the next time, next time you do the pen test, they'll actually have patched it maybe, as opposed to it still being there. So, phishing. Uh, I'm sure there's no surprise here that this actually works. Um, you know, it, organizations have different levels of success. We see anywhere from like 7% to 40% success rates when you are our phishing engagements, usually closer to the 40%. Um, but has anybody here done a phishing engagement, maybe been a part of, show of hands, been a part of maybe click the phishing link? <laughs> Everybody's been a victim? Yeah. I mean, well, yeah. if you've never done a phishing engagement, I'm going to kind of walk you through what we do. So we have um, a, couple, a couple main things we, we hammer down and we're going to go through them. The first thing is figuring out what your customer wants to do and what you're allowed to do, right? So the goals and the rules of engagement. Because, you know, phishing isn't always, you're not always allowed to just pop boxes and start running empire payloads. It's not always the case. Sometimes they just want to see how many people clicked, which is boring to us testers, but it can still drive home the, the situational awareness. So it's still a good, good point there. And then what we like to do is also determine the scenarios. We generally do two types of scenarios. We do our, what we call our, our common malware scenario, ransomware, UPS tracker. You know, we're emulating that threat. Or we do our targeted scenario where we may clone their OWA and clone their do or get a domain name that might matches closely to them and try to be a little more tricky. Um, that's where you get to determine the phishing domains. And then we never step, step, uh, step forward because, believe it or not, email spoofing is still a thing. Like, it, it's crazy. We see it all of them. Um, and then you execute the engagement. We have a full blog on this, so if you want to read up on it as we go through the slides, you can't follow something, you can check out the blog there. Um, so what we like to do is we like to leverage Python for phishing engagement. There's a lot of tools out there to help you do phishing. Um, Lucy is a good one. Um, GoFish is a nice one. Um, we like to leverage Python because, in my experience, with some of these automated tools, they uh, they give a really long URL that gets caught by spam filters. So, with Python, you can kind of make like a little more targeted URL if you're if you're doing click analysis. Um, but we do three main three main ways to do uh, three main types of engagements. The first is click analysis. Determine how many users click the link. Right. So, you know, send it to Johnny. Johnny click the link. All right, Johnny's got to go to the fishing train. Um, the second is credential grabbing, which I really like because, um, especially with organizations that don't use two-factor authentication, those credentials work gold. Um, when you do code execution and stuff, you know, a lot of times, especially if you're in like a PowerShell HTA, you're in memory, and if you know, you may, may lose your payload before you can set up persistence. But credential grabbing, you often can interact with the organization externally, VPN, web, uh, mail, that kind of stuff with those credentials. Those are really nice. So we'll do credential grabbing. We usually just do like a either a basic. Uh, authentication basic authentication prompt, or we'll clone a forms based login with like set. Um, and then redirect it to the legitimate site afterwards if people think, okay, nothing changed, but we just grabbed the credit. Then with, ex with executing code, we like to do Empire because Empire is awesome. Uh, we, we traditionally are targeting Windows clients, so we do a lot of PowerShell stuff. We find a lot of success with uh, Office macros and HTA method. Um, this isn't a talk on Empire, but definitely check it out if you've never heard of it before. It's an awesome tool. So this is the, um, you send you your phishing campaign out. The CEO's reaction to, to opening the email, you the right decision. Ironically, the CEO traditionally isn't on the, the phishing, or he's read on the phishing engagement before, so he's got situational awareness and our experience. But um, this is an example of the phishing scenario, right? So on the left-hand side, we've got the UPS tracking scenario. Um, we'll sit, we'll, you know, it, it obviously looks like a UPS tracker, but it's, you know, if they look at the domain, the domain's usually pretty, you know, not, not with anything. Looks malicious, and then the, on the right hand side, we'll clone their, their login to their, their actual company, and it will look a little more legitimate. And we may spoof from the help desk. I know our last engagement we did, we actually popped the help desk uh, web application, spoofed from the help desk. That was really successful, uh, as you might imagine. Send an email from the help desk, download this file from the help desk website. Uh, and this is an example of the, uh, the phishing domain. So, what we like to do is, um, like, for example, Breakpoint Labs is our legitimate domain, but you could register breakpointlab.com. That'll trick most. Almost anybody at 8 a.m. in the morning, that's going to trick them. And if your goal is more common threat, you may leverage something like this, which is kind of sneaky still, or you may do something like you know a really ugly looking domain that you see with common malware threats. Um, and it's also important to submit these domains to web content filters and proxies, so like Blue Code Proxy, because you may be blocked if you if you don't have it up there. And if you have these domains, you can actually uh, make the internet facing serve sort of legitimate content, so you can get categorized appropriately um, from the web content filters. Those are important things because nothing's worse than sending 
your email and it doesn't work. So I like to test it with my POC and make sure like it gets outbound before we do our test, um, just to make sure it's not, I don't, I don't ruin it. Here's a one slide on how to find email spoofing vulnerabilities, which um, I think was a, a big thing. We already tested this back in the 90s. A lot of pen testers kind of like assume you can't do it. But we, we see it a lot, especially with Google Apps for Work. If you a lot of companies are using that service and they don't tell you how to set that up, uh, DCAM and SPF records out the gate, and you can spoof email through them. So this is an example of how you'd actually do it. Step one, you find the mail servers. Step two, you connect the mail server, you forge the headers, and you forge the body of the email. This is what the mail server is going to see, and this is what actually the user is going to be presented with in their Outlook or whatever mail client. And I'm going to show you this email here that generated this email in Outlook. Right, so immediate password change, that same kind of steps. You can see it looks very legitimate, right? So it's kind of, kind of scary. And, and if you can spoof from the help desk, uh, it's kind of nice. You get a lot better success if, if the email spoofing. That's where you see a 40% success rate. Um, and this is a, just another level of like, all right, how do we do our campaigns? I kind of talked about it. We click analysis. I'll use Python. I'll, I'll basically set like a, a unique number per email. And I'll have my Python parse, okay, user one ties back to this URL. It's just like a variation of the, URL, of the URL, maybe slash one, slash two. And then I can check my access that log and say, okay, one, one, two, three, you know, see who, see who actually clicked the link. Um, credential wrapping, that's a little snippet of PHP code. Again, you can use set to do that. That's like the easiest way, is just clone it with set. Um, and then execute code, the easiest way in my experience. We just like, we like Empire because it's just very reliable. We're getting that initial PowerShell payload, payload of memory. The HTA method's nice. Uh, and then from there, with Empire, you have so many options with like privilege escalation and persistence mechanisms. Even even as an un unprivileged user, like a standard user, you have a lot of options to maintain persistence, which is really nice. So if you haven't looked at Empire, definitely do it. It's a phishing tool, a lot of other things. Um, so the next component here is something very near and dear to my heart, which is web application vulnerabilities. Reason being is this is what falls outside the scope of vulnerability management usually, right? So your people generally, when we pen test them, they generally have a vulnerability management program. They're generally running Nessus and Expose. They're doing the things that they know how to do. But web application vulnerabilities are kind of hard. Sometimes they're not baked into a CVE or they're not, they're, not, they're not known about. It might just be a custom application that they don't realize they've got some critical vulnerability because it, it's a custom application. So this is uh, some questions I ask myself when I'm using the application. I'm trying to tie back to myself. All these questions tie back to how is my input being leveraged? And then I'm going to test and fuzz appropriately for the, for the vulnerability. So if my input's being reflected on the screen, I'm going to look for process scripting vulnerabilities, uh, and so on and so forth. And we're going to walk through an example here um, that shows uh, a file inclusion vulnerability, which is really cool. And we have a full blog on this again if you want to read more about it. So file inclusion vulnerabilities. We're going to walk through an example here. If you've never done a file inclusion vulnerability, this is going to be a, a we're going to kind of massage this to code execution, which, by the way, I say this every talk, but it's true. Uh, if you want to pick up the significant other at a bar, explaining how to massage file inclusion vulnerabilities to code execution is a great way to do it. Presses everybody. Always get, always get some. <laughs> Works every time. Like, oh, man. So the file inclusion can lead to code execution, but not always. So an example here is the PHP include. Mm -hmm. um, versus PHP Echo, right? Mm -hmm. So the Echo is mm -hmm. not going to be necessarily code execution, but you might be able to get Etsy password to the screen or whatever sensitive files. But the, if you're doing an include, it actually interprets the input as code. So if you can get your, your you can get code in that include statement, you can actually get some code execution. Um, LFIs require a little more work usually. You've got to get your input on disk somewhere, maybe in a log file or something, or what have you, and then include that, that input, include that file. RFIs are a whole lot more easier, and you can just like point it back to yourself and have it run code from your box. Um, which are nice. So this is a scenario I ran into a pen test. I was doing unlike content enumeration on this application. It was a pretty hard external site. I mean, we were coming from the internet, and I'm like starting to get a little. At, at the start of every test, you start to get a little bit of discouragement until you start getting some wins. Once you get that first win, you get the things start toppling over. But to get that first win, it takes some work. So I'm, I'm hit, I hit this one debug.php, and as you can see, my site here just just had a blank white screen, right? And you see in burp right there, it just said 200 OK, and it didn't give me anything. So at this point, I almost gave up. I almost said debug.php, OK, whatever. I, you know, it's PHP code, so you can't actually see the source code. Um, so I can see much. So I didn't have a whole lot to go on here. But thinking, I was like, OK, this, maybe this, this you know, resource takes in inputs. So I'm, uh, the next thing I'm going to do is, uh, two. <laughs> next thing I'm going to do is actually, um, yeah, you saw a little joke. <laughs> next thing I'm going to do is, is going to try to figure out what inputs get, you know, are on this particular resource. So I'm actually going to try to fuzz get parameters and post parameters to see, hey, if I supply input, does it do something to that input? 
Um, I, and I was doing that, I went through that process, and it was taking a while, I actually ended up going to lunch and coming back and never underestimate the power of a good lunch. In this case, I probably would have been sick, but... Um, a little back up here, so here we are. So this is a real scenario, and this allowed me to take over a, the, an organization on the internet, which is awesome, right? So the scenario here, I, I, I went to Burp's Intruder, I started fuzzing through um, common parameter names, Burp has a list for that actually, and this worked in the common list. Um, so I, I did page equals test, and what I saw was page equals test, I saw, okay, the, the response like was different. Everything else was 193, white screen. For page equals test, it was 633. All right, that's cool. So let's go check out what it is. And it's actually a PHP warning, and if you see here, it's saying include test. So I'm trying to include my input. So I'm getting, I'm getting excited, because we're, we're, we're starting to unearth this, this code, potential code execution vulnerability. So the next step is to try to get it to, I, I did the Etsy password, local, local file inclusion, no big deal, but more importantly, I was like, let me see if I can point it back to myself and get code to run for myself. So I threw that snippet of code, that PHP system ID, into one.php, which if you know me, and there's only a few people here do, I name everything one.php or one.py, so terrible. good luck finding out what, what script you need to, for me, because it's named the same thing. Um, but anyway, <laughs> okay. I, 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 one, two, I, yeah, everything's one, two, three. Know what it's, it a, is. it's a mess. But um, in any event, <laughs> I started a Python simple HTTP server, which is pen testers is a great way just to get a little web server up, throw it back to you, make sure your ACL's open. Um, you know, so I made a GET request for my code right there. Here it is making the request. And then in step three, you can see the web server's running it. Now, I recreated this with, my, with a VM on the customer system. It was on a Windows box running its NTF array system, which is amazing. I love that. Because uh, the next, obviously, it makes everything else easier. But uh, in this example, this was on the internet, and it was on the internet for over ten years, and it had this vulnerability because it wasn't CDSS, You know, nobody knew. Uh, pretty cool. So I just made a little web shell, and all this is doing right here, this Python script is just literally taking that request and automating it through Python with the request module. If you want to get into web exploitation, the request module makes things really nice and easy. Um, it's, it's stupid. If you've never played with Python, it's just it's it's easy. Definitely give it a shot. And you can just see here, I'm just typing web commands. And again, from in the real scenario, um, we were NT3 systems. So at that point, you can pull credentials out of memory from any cats. You can, you know, it privilege escalation, or you don't need privilege escalation, but going from it, the local admin to domain admin isn't too bad, especially when you're on a server that has the admins logged in. Kind of nice. Um, yep, yeah, and that's that's it. Password for Zach. All right. Tag in. Good. All right, so this brings us to the third way that we get an initial foothold, and it's basically through something called multicast name resolution and poisoning these different protocols. So think about like a majority of the time with like Windows environments. It's an internal network, we have connectivity, you know, we're good to go. Um, essentially, let's say we can't, a DNS query happens, and it can't map an IP to a, a domain or a host or something that's on the network. Um, it's going to look at your, you know, your host file. It's going to do that DNS. But what happens if that fails? These protocols come into play, and usually they're enabled on Windows environments. So we have Link Local Multicast Name Resolution (LLMNR). Limner, that's a long one, the mouthful. NetBIOS Name Services. That's so it goes down this chain, and then Multicast DNS. So essentially, these protocols are supposed to help in like broadcast across the Windows environment and say, hey. You know, does anyone know the answer to this question that I can't solve? This IP, where is it? You know, to this host or this, uh, you know, or this share that we're looking for. And essentially, as a bad guy, we can use a tool that I'm about to show you. It's not highly creative, but it's awesome. It's open source. That essentially you can listen on the network, intercept, and manipulate this resolution traffic. And it, over time, you're going to definitely get some hits if this is enabled. And Essentially, what we're going to do is we're going to perform man-in-the-middle attacks, and we can essentially even relay some of these authentication attempts as we see them come through, which is pretty scary. And we have an entire blog post on this one as well. So if you get you want to go into more detail, you feel free to check that out. So the tool is Responder. It's a Python script, right? It's like the Wreck-It Ralph of essentially destroying a network and basically you're misusing something that was supposed to be for usability and something for good, right? Well. We all, you know, tread lightly because this tool also can take down a switch. We actually recently had this happen. It calls the denial service with a Cisco switch, um, so it just couldn't handle the multicast protocols. But Responder, this is created by Spider Labs. It's open source. You can totally just go down, you know, download it, start playing with it, give it a switch H, see all of its features. Uh, but essentially, what it does is it's a multicast protocol poisoning tool. And it's going to do that exact thing. It also has other switches like WPAT spoofing, which essentially with IE, this is enabled by default, usually version 6 through 10, I believe. Um, it has this web proxy auto discovery feature where every time you go out to the internet on IE, it's going to check for this WPAD entry. 
and we can make a malicious WPAD server and WPAD.dat uh, WPAD file and basically say every time someone opens IE, it's going to actually come to me and I could maybe you know, stage a malicious credential grabber or try and capture some authentication attempt for that. Man in the middle attacks, this is what it's basically known for. It's going to try and intercept credential exchanges between hosts. So on the network, you're going to see a lot of traffic. If you just listen to this, you'll see it like going on. But we can essentially uh, grab these authentication attempts, and a lot of times they're NTLM v2 or NTLM v1 or man if they're really bad. But depending on that, you can either do password cracking, you can pass the hash just maybe if it's old. Um, you could do this relay attack, and we'll get into that in a little bit. And essentially, even you could even relay to other protocols. Hashtag hot potato, which is a great thing from uh, Fox Club. They basically said that you could take these HTTP requests with WPAD, redirect it to NTLM authentication login, and then grab that, and then it's pretty dirty. Yeah, so check that out, too. Um, and from default, when you start Responder, it's going to start a bunch of these scary rogue services. So it's going to try and capture a lot of different authentication attempts across a lot of different protocols, TCP, UDP, the like. So feel free to look at that. It's in a config file, so you can turn them on and off. It's very easy. And the best part is when you're running this tool, it's logging a lot of these things that's going on. So it's going to bring it to standard out in Linux, but you know it's going to be logging everything as it actually captures these you know authentication attempts and this traffic that's going on. So I'm going to go over three use cases. So that way you can try this if you if you're allowed to, or you can do it in a virtual machine environment. You know, and it's safe. Uh, but essentially here, I did a start responder. The dash uh, I right there is the interface, so I'd say just eth zero. And then I do a dash uh, lowercase f, and this is going to fingerprint, much like an nmat switch o, where you're trying to like figure out the operating system and like different things with versioning. This is the same kind of thing, but what it's going to do is it's actually doing that poisoning for the LLMNR. It's seeing the LLMNR traffic and seeing that BIOS traffic, as you can see. And it's also trying to fingerprint what's the OS going on. You know, it's a, so you see here's a Windows 7 client. You got a Windows Server 2008. It's getting you all this information. And we actually see the poisoning's working. We're getting an authentication attempt right here via SMB for an administrator with a TASH, NTLMB2, though. So uh, the second use case, I kind of touched on it briefly, but that WPAD, if we want to actually do that, we can make it kind of dirty in our own way, too. We could do that E0 again, listen. Anytime someone connects to an IE or another browser that has the auto discovery feature enabled, um, essentially we could do the switch BW, which we start that WPAD server, that malicious uh, service in that DAT file, and it's going to make that request and go, does anyone, if, if DNS doesn't have a text record of the WPAD, it's going to go, does anyone know where the WPAD file is? And us being on there, we're going to be like, it's us! Send us your traffic! We're right here! And we're going to give you a nice little basic authentication prompt that looks normal, right? And he's like, ah, oh, Windows is prompting me for my credits, so I'm okay. <laughs> and then I get your credits. So thanks very much. And this is all just because of this poisoning. If you can't actually do the poisoning, it's off the table, not in the cards. Um, there's a blue teamer you could look into this and just see, is this traffic going on in my network? Um, or if you're a red teamer and you're just doing like a vulnerability assessment and not really a pen test, um, you could basically do this switch capital A. This is going to analyze the network, see if the traffic's actually going on, and see if it could be a vulnerability or lead to something that's even scarier. So feel free to look at that too. So how do we prevent this? There's a couple of different ways you can prevent it. First of all, you can disable the broadcast protocols that we talked about, the LMNR, the NetBIOS name resolution. Uh, they definitely help your network in trying to like ensure that things are discovered and found over these broadcast protocols, but they aren't absolutely necessary. For WPAD, we can make that WPAD file entry in DNS, so that way we can't poison it, although in that Fox Club article as well, with Hot Potato, they said that you can flood the DNS and you know, then basically, if you're if you have that WPAD staged and you're saying I'm the WPAD, it's going to basically go to that. So it, it it can be bypassed, but that's a good practice as well to do the WPAD file entry in DNS. Um, you can also segment the local network so that way, you know, when this when these these protocols are being done, we're running Responder. If we're only in a certain VLAN, you know, we're not in like you know, if it's not so open, that can help prevent the impact, the attack surface. And we can also ensure that we're using NTLM v2 at least. <laughs> Uh, we do not want to use you know, NTLM v1 and because it can downgrade, and sometimes you definitely don't want to be using LAMAM. That's very bad. That's this, a good question. Joel, sure. what's your uh, return like on investment in time and cracking those NTLM version 2 passwords? 
when I'm usually on the assessment, absolutely. You know, it's a crunch, right? You have like yeah. two or three days, maybe four, maybe a week to Same get that. Scenario, yeah. And you know, some of these passwords are super complex. You know, and you might not get into reports until the end of the uh, assessment. Absolutely. So. I feel like the answer to this question is going to be answered in this slide in this series. Sure. When you get these NC1v2 ones, you want to try and relay them if you can, and there's ways of doing that, because the password cracking is just going to be much harder, unless you have a beautiful rig that can just handle it. Yeah, um, and we, we deal with this too. I mean, we, we do deal with DoD environments. For 15 character passwords are wrong, you know? So it, it's, it's in the commercial realm, it's a little easier. Um, the winter times, 2016. Yeah. <laughs> We make fun of that in this later, but I, I definitely think that you should try this, what we're about to go over. Um, it can help with these V2 ones because they're definitely a, a much more harder thing to crack than we can definitely relay or attach here. So, SMB relay attacks. This kind of is a relay from the uh, NetBIOS multicast near resolution poison um, into this. So, essentially, once we insert ourselves, you know, between this NTLM challenge response protocol exchange, we saw earlier that we, we call that NTLM v2 uh, user and hatch. So once we start that, we need to stage essentially like a malicious SMB or HTTP and do that. And this initiation can occur over that multicast poisoning that we did earlier with LM and R and NetBIOS. Also, we could see potentially automated processes attempting to authenticate across the network. So this also happens too. And you'll see this a lot with patch management, antivirus, vulnerability scanners, custom scripts too. And what's happening is you're trying to log in over SMB and you're doing it from a domain controller to a client. And you're saying, I want to run this and then just you know run an update or like check in, see if the shares are there, map. Well, what you're doing is you're actually sending these creds across the network. And if malicious, you know, if you're running like something like Responder, or you're running this SMB relay tool we're about to show you, we can grab this authentication attempt and basically relay it and log into the client. And it, now we have access to the system. So it's kind of complicated in a way, but you can read the blog post as well for further uh, to try this as well. So I'm going to go over like how to do this in a lab environment. So we, we to answer your question, we often don't crack them, we'll, we'll relay them. Yeah, gotcha. So, you arrive on the scene, right? You're a red teamer. Blue team's like, all right, everything's great. I'm gonna run my best scan. I'm gonna patch everything before they get to it. This is gonna be great, they're gonna look like fools. We start two tools. Maybe responder, try and capture that multicast. We start SMB relay. We're waiting, we're gonna target one of your clients. And we're gonna wait and see if an authentication attempt from the Nessus scan comes and we can relay it and then log into the box that they was trying to get into. So, high level, this is what normally happens, right? Let's say an agent's installed on a Windows client. You got your domain controller here. Nessus scanner is running. I'm not picking on Nessus, I promise you. This happens with a lot of other things. Um, but you're essentially gonna do that NTLM, the whole exchange. It's gonna try and authenticate over SMB run its authenticated credential uh, vulnerability scan, and it's good to go. Made the connection. Well, if we, as an attacker, put ourselves in the middle, run this SMB relay tool, what we can do is we can actually see this authentication attempt when it is made to our box on the local network, and we can say we're targeting that one because we know it's gonna get scanned, and we can say, all right, send it to me, okay, and then I'm gonna actually grab it and then relay it and log in. So I essentially like came into the middle here and just essentially logged right into that box. So don't scan the attacker box. Yeah, don't scan the attacker box, which you don't know what it is. Okay, so from a high level, let's run through it. This is a little, this is in the blog post and it's easier to follow than that. But the attacker's IP, this is us, we're the 103. The domain controller is gonna be the 102, the client's the 105. Now, we're in Kali Linux, it's our virtual machine for the attacker box. We create a, a malicious binary here, and it's MSF Venom, we're making that reverse TCP, and we're setting that all up, and we're making it an executable, and I call it matures onexe for this simple purpose here. I also want to set my multi-handler, I want to make sure that matches exactly with the way I configured the malicious binary, set that up, stage it, make sure that the handler is running, and I also want to set the feature, the auto run script, so that way it'll migrate if this all goes according to plan, and I can get that executable onto the share of, through the authentication. From there, I'm gonna open up another terminal in Kali, and I'm gonna run uh, from mpacket. It's this whole suite of different Python scripts. You wanna run the smb relay x.py. Uh, you wanna point it at the Windows client that we're targeting, 
And we're going to point it with the switch E to the uh, executable that we want to upload if we get this authentication successfully uh, going over, relayed over. Uh, from the domain controller, you can see here this is a successful one. It's like, this is just a basic group of concept. It's like, hey, I'm trying to connect to the Windows client for the C, you know, C share. You see that actually work. Well, what if it tries to make that same connection but to our attacker IP? We can see maybe it's going to try and authenticate to log in and see if our shares are there. And we can grab that and then relay it to that 105. And now we've got access. Is this the video? Yeah. Okay. All right. And if in the handler, what's going on is essentially you're going to see once we successfully grab that authentication, we log into the client. We have our uh, executable binary we made in Venom load into the share. Uh, we're going to see that we're actually getting it back, our connection. And we're seeing the handler working. We see that it's migrating as, well, as like we wanted. And it's going to a more steady service. And now we have our interpreter shell. This is just a basic group of concept you can do in a virtual machine environment. Now, I'd say a picture is worth, you know, a thousand words. That's like the old saying. I think a video is worth like 10,000 words. So I'm, I'm hoping this video works. Maybe the slightly demo god bless me here. Uh, but essentially, I'm going to show you a live action and kind of explain it as it's happening of the SMB relay attack scenario we talked about with Nessus. And you can do this with a free trial. Um, you can just download, put it on. I, and what I did here was I downloaded a free trial of Nessus, put it on the domain controller in the scenario. And then I have my SMB relay, my handler running in Cali. And we're going to see if it is going to make that connection to me. <clears throat> and then I'm going to relay and log into that 105 Windows client that's also there. So here's the video. But essentially, started my SMB relay at the high, got my handler running, going over to Nessus. I'm like, hey, I'm going to run this authenticated uh, credentialed scan against that Windows client. Give it a hot toddy here. We're going to see that the relay is going to capture that authentication request. It's going to look for a share that it can potentially load our malicious binary to. Boom. Boom. This is good. Okay. Handler, okay, okay, okay. And boom. We migrated. We have access. Great success. Great success. And this was all from an NTLM v2 you know, authentication attempt that just happened across the network. And as you can see, it was administrator. Because when we do these credential scans, a lot of times it's a local or domain administrator. Just to be clear, as you scan the, the you scan the scan is to the attacker box. You had then you had to have the client IP in the configuration right. of the of the relay. So, so yeah, this is assuming that you're on the network, right? You're on the local network. You know the IP scheme, and you know that it's just going to probably do a vulnerability scan across all the clients on the, on the network. So you take a scan, and then you, you trip across it. You know, like, yeah. whoa! And this is if yeah, there's an agent installed because I think Nessus can do multiple different ways to authenticate scans. But if there's an agent installed, and it has to you know authenticate through the SMB. That's where you get to get it here. And this was if you know the video didn't work. I want to have at least a fallback. All right, so how do we prevent SMB relay attacks? Essentially, um, one way of doing this is you can require SMB signing. This is that digital, uh, basically, way of the packet, at the packet level. We can ensure that you know the origin, the authenticity is legit. We're good to go. You can disable the protocols like we saw with the LMNR and BIOS. That's another scenario where we could relay potential attempts from those protocols. Um, the WPAD entry and DNS. Prevent SMB outbound, uh, that's just a good practice in general. And you can enable e EPA. Uh, this is also just a basic way to enhance the authentication um, across the network with Windows. Number five way we get in, account compromise. People, this is real life. You walk around your office, you walk around any person's organization, you're going to see this. It happens. You're going to see notebooks of this. And Andrew, we usually wait until about like 7 p.m. the first night, and then we'll roll around yeah. and go to desks. A bunch of creepy people. But this, that's if it's in scope. Trust me, we don't break scope ever. Yeah, right? Yeah. So if it's a law, it's allowed. Yeah. Yeah. But you'll see this kind of stuff. And I mean, it's human nature. People write down stuff they forget about. They leave it on their desk. It's, it's human nature. If you're not security minded, it's definitely going to happen. Um, and if you have no password policy in place, you're probably going to have weak passwords like that. So, account compromise. If you ran a vulnerability scan, right, you may find these three things. And they may come back like all loads. Like, okay, I can enumerate usernames potentially. Um, there is no automation controls placed, meaning there's no lockout. 
So if I'm trying to authenticate to a web application, there's no lockout in place um, if after a bunch of bad attempts. And there's no password complexity, as we saw there, that winter 2016. That's not really that great. Um, all these things, when pieced together, this is that manual testing mindset. We want to bridge all these things and get that ultimate prize, which is the account compromise. And I'm going to run through some ways you can identify this. So account compromise, username enumeration. This can be done through several different things. Um, one being a password reset feature. Maybe you know the password reset feature, uh, it tells you via its error message, um, that's not a valid user. But then when you actually put in a valid user, it says, oh, I sent the email. So now I know that that person is a valid, you know, that's a valid account, I can add it to my list. Um, log in error message, um, as messages, you know, WordPress is guilty of this sometimes. Um, it'll say it's not a, it's not a valid username. You know, and instead of saying, you know, it's not a valid set of credentials, it's telling me that's not a valid account. Why are you even trying? So you can look for those kind of things. Contact us features. You'll see this a lot, like with, with internal apps, but you see this with external apps too. And even one time I saw it where uh, it was a contact us and said, which admin it was a drop down list? Which admin do you want to contact with your problem? So now I know all the admin accounts here, and I can try and brute force them as well, probably. Um, when you're doing BERT and Intruder, you want to look for like different things like Andrew showed you with the length and the response. You also want to look for the time. So maybe you know it, on, a, on a valid attempt, it was really quick. On invalid attempts, it actually was like kind of longer in the response. Kind of check for that. Is. User registration. This is kind of hard to. to Fix, but that account already exists. So I mean, when you try and register Bob one, you know that's probably going to exist. But if you tried Bob two, you, you know, then now Bob one is real because it will tell you if it's not or not. Yeah. Uh, various error messages. Look for these error messages. That some are more verbose than others. Uh, look at the client side source code. Um, also look if there's any kind of web technology you're up against. It's open source. Go on GitHub. Check out exactly everything that's going on there and view the source. Um, Google hacking, OSINT, you could talk about this for days, but there's tons of different things you can do with that. Um, and sometimes the application just flat out tells you usernames. Um, I know with like PHP Bulletin, for example, it tells you the last person that logged in the bottom right corner, which is nice. Um, so check for these kind of things, gather your usernames, and you can essentially you know, build this list up. No automation control. So essentially, you got those usernames, right? Now you're going to try and brute force them if you can. Um, and see if there's any kind of thing in play. So I, I always like to use Burp with any web application pen test. It is essentially like the go-to tool. Um, but you're going to pull up that request, let's say in Burp, and then you're going to use Repeater, and you're going to try that Bob1 account that you know is a valid user, and you're going to try it with like a bunch of bogus passwords, maybe 10 times. Well, if you see after 10 tries, there's no difference in response, you're not getting a lockout or anything, it seems like brute force is probably on the table. So let's move that re repeater request to intruder so we can automate this, right? So there's no lockout. Essentially, we want to just keep knocking on the door, and we can use Burps Intruder to do that. There's a lot of password lists out there via like set list and all these different projects. Um, but if there is no like, capture to try and thwart this, or there's no like token or anything in that, that realm to try and stop this, you know, or lockout policy in place. We're going to try and just keep knocking on the door, and especially with basic authentication, there's no lockout feature with basic authentication. So if you're using that, you can just keep going and going and going until you successfully get in. Um, and also, maybe you've locked down the main login for the site, but also check and see if there's like a mobile interface. Sometimes the policy is not the same there, and you can also check for API logins, and maybe you know they don't have any automation controls in place. And ultimately, weak passwords. This is me preaching to the security choir. Uh, we're just bad at passwords sometimes if there's no policy in place to make us make them complicated and complex or long. Um, so we've seen it all in all the time. Uh, people use the same username as their password. People use variations of password. People will use the month and year, and they'll just change it whenever the policy makes them. Um, they'll use the company name and year. Um, keyboard walks, they think they're fancy by doing that QAZ and then that 2 uh, WSX, you know? So, there's tons of different things you can even do a password generator to make these keyboard walk lists. And there's tons of things out there, like I mentioned before, with like Seclist Project that has good password lists out there. Keyboard walks gets the admins a lot of times, usually. Yeah. Things. Yeah, we see that a lot. So there's lots of word lists out there. Consider even making a targeted one. You can use a tool like Cool, uh, where it basically crawls and scrapes different applications and tries to make custom word lists for you for passwords. And that's a pretty cool one. 
Um, also, if you know you're targeting like a user's interest, you could try and say like, I know Bob is the CEO, and he's a huge Washington Redskins fan, so I'm gonna try and do a lot of different variations of using that football team in the password. Yeah, let's do all of per current and previous rosters. Just right? Jump into the word list. You know, What's that? What happens. Sign Kirk. That would just be the password, right? All right, so account compromise default. So essentially, what I was trying to present there is if you grab all these different like vulnerabilities, they're low impact, but when you piece them all together, you can really get that ultimate critical or high vulnerability, and that's account compromise. And that opens up a whole new realm and a whole new world to different vulnerabilities and you can discover. So once you get a valid set of credentials, try and brute force it across all the things, but don't lock people out, right? Because different protocols will have different lockouts. So like, try it up on RDP, try it on SSH, try it on these different things. Um, a lot of different tools you can use. I went over like web app focus, like with Burp. Um, and you could also use Hydra. You could use Crack Map Exec. Crack Map Exec. You could use. Uh, there's a lot of different Metasploit modules. Some do like database uh, reporting, SMB reporting. There's MMAP, NSC scripts. There's all these things out there. Check them out. Um, always try default creds. I know that's kind of a gimme, but it works a lot with internal. Um, pen tests more than external, but they still work with external too. Um, and if those don't work, those valid set of credentials that are default, um, try at least the, the default account. A lot of times people don't change the account, they may just change the password. So you've got at least one piece of the puzzle there. And we commonly see that once you know we have an account, um, it's shared across you know an environment. So if it's a Linux environment, if it's root creds, it can be shared, and same with Windows. And it's just for ease of usability but really it's a bad security practice, so you're gonna see that a lot. My final thoughts and tips, just to give you, um, if you do the web pen testing or if you're interested in anything that's internet facing, use passive reconnaissance tools like uh, Census and Shodan, they're great. They, um, they have an API, they have a web interface. You can say they're, uh, well Shodan is not free, but it's free to a certain extent, um, not for the API at least. But these are great projects. They have a lot of information out there on if you just give it an organization's name, it's IP space, um, a single IP. They'll tell you there's ports and services. Maybe if there's vulnerabilities that exist, like Heartbleed still out there, stuff like that. So feel free to check those out. They're great passive reconnaissance tools. You don't even have to send a single packet yourself. It's already in a database. Uh, make sure you investigate shares. A great tool to use is the Enum for Linux. It's essentially just a Perl script that wraps you know, about EXE and it can get you a lot of good information on shares and potentially uh, domain policies and different things, password policies and Windows environments too, all over SSD. Um, unlinked content enumeration like Andrew touched on, that debug got PHP, that was like awesome. I mean it literally led us to an RCE. Uh, it was just, you know, so always make sure you look for unlinked content on web applications because a lot of times developers will have projects or tools installed or certain things that they don't realize are internet accessible. Um, you can use Seclist, they have a lot of great fuzzing um, word lists in there for different technologies too. Um, passwords written on sticky notes, yeah, usually we see this. When you're walking around your organization next time in the office, you know, peek around, maybe see if Joe's uh, got his passwords written down on his desk, you know. Tell me, Joe. Keyboard. Jed, that's, that's bad. That's poor offset, Joe. Um, can you reset a password via the help desk? This is fun if you have social engineering at the table. So if, I'm going to call the help desk generally at every pen test where I can do some kind of social engineering, and I'm going to say, impersonate somebody. I love doing impersonations. You know, um, the pronoun. Yeah. No. <laughs> that was the last conference. Um, and essentially, I'm going to call and try and say, like, hey, I'm this person and I want my password reset, and I'm gonna try and use that trust relationship and see if the help desk actually helps me. If, if they question it or they're like, this doesn't sound like Joe, then they're probably gonna walk down to my desk and then I'm just gonna hang it real quick. But you know, it's, it, you gotta try it. See if you can use that trust relationship. Yeah, that one time he's like, oh, what, which password do you wanna reset? Your admin one or your regular one? Oh, my admin one. <laughs> my admin one, thank you. How are your kids doing? They're doing great. Yeah, exactly, you have to like play along with everything. Um, put, put a focus on feature abuse, like Andrew kind of touched on too, like, you, you kind of always want to think like, what does the technology do? Why is it built? What is the usability? What are its features and functionalities? How could I misuse them? This happens a lot, especially with applications. Um, so always kind of think that attacker mindset. And once you get a, salad, a valid set of creds, um, try and cross all the things. If you lock people out, tell the admin or sysadmin you're really sorry. <laughs> Here's some useful trainings and links. Um, I love, we love Cyber. It's, it's got a lot of stuff out there. They've got a lot of free trainings. We've done some session Wednesdays with them. They're a good organization. They're local, so we like that. Uh, CFTs, 
uh, Capture the Flags. If you essentially want to look, there's, there's a lot of good stuff there on Phone Hub and in Pentester Lab. Trainings, like we said, we like all set. We like sand, we have a lot of sand certs, and Security Tube is really good if you're kind of in a bind uh, for some great training at a lower cost. So check that out. Um, a lot of books here, a lot of talks, feel free to check out. And a good GitHub resource that has a lot of different things that cover all InfoSec is this uh, security list for fun and profit. So check that out as well. These slides are online. Yeah, so we have it on SlideShare. And um, we gave this talk at Eastside's Philly in December. Um, so there's a video of that on the blog as well for Breakpoint Labs. And other than that, we're Breakpoint Labs. We're hiring. Um, a couple positions open. So feel free to ping us on that, and you can reach out to us on all that information. Thank you very much. Uh, I, have, I just had a thought. You had the, on the, on the slide, when you're in step two, you're talking about your um, your fishing campaign, decided using the track, you know, it's you should use the word list that you use to find your uh, unlinked pages as an input to, instead of just like one.php, you have like login, form, admin, you know, whatever, so that when the links, the links look, everyone has a unique link that looks oh, like it yeah. could be a real link. Yeah, we do, we do that. I think the one.php was, um, was like for the example when I was throwing the